Good morning and thank you for attending. Uh, we're at the Sleepy Hollow Learning Center here with Kevin Sprecher and Kevin Duffy. And before we get started here, just a reminder that uh, this Thursday, we're going to have Mark Brodia from Columbia University. He's going to do a seminar with us at 10 a.m. And then on Friday, I'll be with Paul Theron at his facility, downtown golf in Stanford. And we're going to get into doing some, well, Paul's going to get into do it. I'm going to observe. But we're going to do some uh, uh, workshop with club repair and so forth. So, you know, if uh, if you have a shop or you want to start a shop, if you have something you want your assistants to, to learn about club repair, tune in then. And what the what we're going to do this morning here is Kevin Sprecher is the director of instruction, and along with him is Kevin Duffy, who uh, has partnered up with Kevin this morning. And Kevin is from Acton, Massachusetts, which I understand is just east of Boston. So pay attention to to that because then you can go up there and get a get a full body assessment. And so Kevin does a lot of fitness and rotational training. He works with a lot of uh, professional athletes, both in and out of golf. And so Kevin Sprecher's interest was, how do I get my players better fit for golf, more functional, so I can get, you know, obviously more flexibility, more strength, more speed. And with that in mind, we're going to turn it over to Kevin and Kevin. Thanks, John. Thank you. So I met Kevin last year uh, presenting at the Connecticut PGA. And um, I think all of you know, working with our clients, they're sitting at a desk, they're always doing something like this, but they want to swing like Rory. And it's like, you know, it's reality versus what, what they actually can and can't do. And so Kevin and I came up with this idea to present, to present about, you know, how a teacher can work with a fitness professional. Uh, we did some stuff yesterday with some of my clients uh, and it was, it's just, it's an amazing difference between having somebody like Kevin on staff because your player can't move. He does a quick evaluation, gets him to move and does some other things. And I've, I've actually watched Tony Ruggiero down at Old Palm quite a bit this winter work with uh, Kobe Tuye, how they interact to do this stuff. And, it, and it's like, I'm jealous of that because you know, we all teach however many people every day and they can't move and see the differences just kind of enhances what I'm able to do with them. So I thought it'd be great to kind of talk to everyone about what, what we can do and have Kevin kind of go through some of the stuff that, that he does with uh, golfers to get them better right away. I'm going to steal a little bit of his quote, which is, he can't get you stronger today, but he can get you more loose and maybe even a little bit faster. So Kevin, why don't you go through some of the stuff that you do with some people? Yeah, so basically the major concept is how do I make somebody more efficient right then and there in the session? whether it's a group fitness session on the range or if it's in the gym, obviously we're gonna have different needs. When we walk into a setting with a golf professional like you guys, it's easier for me to make change as quickly as possible, but also go over what's actually gonna last. So the big thing that I'm gonna be talking about today is like the three, three kings of the swing that's gonna make a difference immediately. So balance, posture, and hips, the easiest way for me to affect change. If somebody on the range I'm diagnosed with a shoulder injury or lack of range of motion in the wrist, I can't, you know, hey, let's stop the lesson and manipulate. Not only is I'm not a physical therapist, but it's not practical. It doesn't help anybody there. But if I'm able to diagnose, hey, you can't make that swing the way that you just showed me on an Instagram video because of your shoulder and we can address it, I may have just solved you a headache that you wouldn't you'd be working through for the next 10 lessons trying to get the guy to turn there instead of like, hey, that shoulder's never going to get there without physical therapy. So whether it's on the range or if it's in the gym, you're going to have different settings and different goals. But if you walk down the line and address people's posture and coach them up on why they should feel that way or what exercises can get there, we can kind of solve some of those nagging issues that keep showing up with a similar miss that may be just addressed from a physical need standpoint. Perfect. So, so like one of the examples yesterday, we had a, a young girl, I had a young girl in here, pretty good athlete, uh, but she was swinging at about 90, 92 miles an hour with the driver. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I just like watching how he, kind of, how he processed the information, or Kev did, and he had her do some, some she wasn't very stable on her left side. Yeah. So she, when, he, when she goes through, she has a lot of hip thrust, which slows her swing down a little bit. 
So Kev kind of jumped in. Why don't you show us the exercises and what you did with us? Yeah, so a couple of drills we noticed with junior golfers uh, also will translate on the other side. So with our older golfers and junior golfers, we might see actually similar issues where it's a lack of control because they have too much speed or if it's a lack of control because they haven't used that balance in a while. It's the same problem. It's a similar solution, uh, just different reasons. So if the young girl has more speed and she doesn't trust her body to use it, then she won't go out. So if we yell at her to stomp on it or we try to hype her up, it won't matter. If she doesn't trust that she can't hit a ball and not fall, it only will go so far. So for her, we improved her balance quickly. Uh, and by improving her balance, I just made her aware that you need to use this. More. So we had her jump down the hallway. And the whole time I was trying to get her to put a Nike footprint in the ground. So the drill is as simple as getting her to jump. Now, she wanted to jump like she's jumping over a puddle. That doesn't really give us any feedback. But if I get her to use her posterior chain, her butt and hamstring in the middle of her foot more effectively, and then I have her do 10 jumps. How does it feel? Where are you feeling it? Okay, great. Have her do another 10 jumps, ask her the same question. Swing again, we were able to get her from you know, 90, 91, 92 to 94, 95 in the first couple swings and she ended up coming in for a driver fitting and we just told her it wasn't the driver, it's you. And so we are gonna make much bigger differential and especially in not the professional side of the house. I'll make a larger gain from a club head speed or from a physical side of the house if I address the physical need before I address the golf equipment need. And then the fun part is when you address both at the same time, the numbers are just crazy. Then, then I'm their best friend. I think the physical part, when you work with a lot of kids, everybody wants to hit it far. But these kids weigh 80, 90, maybe even 100 pounds, and they're trying to swing as fast as they can. The bodies can't handle it. And you see a lot of heads dropping back. And they do that to help counter the club weight. So which it teaches them to accelerate the club fast. If you ever want to do a quick speed jump, it, it, just let your head drop back and you'll accelerate the club faster. Ball's going to go way offline, but at least you're going to swing faster. The problem is when these kids, as they get older, what I'm finding is they don't work themselves out of it because they're used to doing that move. So getting somebody like Kevin there to, to show them how to use their body better. Like that was a, for me, that was an impressive transformation for her because she, she does work out, but she's never worked on that specific exercise. And she, she picked up two miles an hour within four minutes. Yeah. So just imagine what she could have done in 35 or 40 minutes working with that over a period of time. So, and, you know, for kids, it's just so important for them to develop the strength to be able to do a lot of that stuff. Yeah, not just from the kid's standpoint, because most of our clients, working with kids is really fun. It's, I don't know about you guys, but it's not my primary clientele. My primary clientele is somewhere between 33 to 61. That's probably my primary clientele. But they're going to have the same needs and wants that a, a young golfer is. They want more distance, they want more speed, they want more control. So if I'm addressing balance, posture, hips on every single session, I'm talking about it, why it's important in between the, the time, touching base with their swing coach, like, hey, are you working on this with them? I'm, I'm home, like making sure you're on the same vocabulary. Like, I tried to mirror some of the speech that he was using. Hey, remember that thing Kev's asking you to do? It would be this in the in the workout. You feel that? Oh, I know that. And how that transition between it it makes them feel like it's a one stop shop because essentially you want to know that your club fitter knows your golf pro, who knows your fitness pro, and they're all working on you is a pretty good feeling. It's a pretty good package. Yeah, I think that's important, and one of the reasons why I trust Kevin is I know he's going to back up with what I'm saying, he's not gonna throw me under the bus so much. Even, I, even if I say something wrong, he may say it a little bit differently and, and it still make me look pretty good. Yeah, I, I don't need him to be an expert at teaching in a deadlift. If he tells them the hinge and they're not getting it, it's very easy for me to spice it up a little bit differently, deliver the same package with the same same needs are met. Let's, uh, why don't we go through some of the, the balance and hand stroke that the exercises you like to do? Yeah, the, ba um, the, the balance drills that um, are easiest to incorporate are the fact that people aren't using one foot at a time. Like, when was the last time any of you stood on one foot for 20 seconds? Never. When was the last time you did? 
You did okay. A little block next to you. Ankle mobility, right? All right, so one. Right. Two. Okay, great. We have some. So how many of your members do you think are working on their balance as we speak? Probably zero. So if I get them to even do it, like participate, let's get a participation trophy. Try and work on your balance. That's great. So then the easiest one is I can sell them on a jumper. And everybody at one point in time has seen, knows, maybe owns, dusted off. There's a jump rope. So getting them to jump rope, getting them to balance on one foot, getting them to actually step up and down on one foot at a time is really easy. So we're trying to sell the goal and I'm trying to make it simple. And so my whole conversation and, and the thing I've been making my bread and butter on is I'm trying to make the golf fitness process more simple. I'm not trying to overcomplicate it. Um, so the easiest exercise for somebody to improve their balance on is one, try, practice it. Number two would be jump rope. Number three would be jumping side to side. So if they can't jump here to here, I'm not going to coach them to try to jump across the whole room. It has no bearing. So if they can jump from tape to tape, great. If they can jump tape to tape next week, it's further and they're able to improve their balance. The odds of them showing up to the lesson with Kevin, their club head speeding higher, club head speed being higher is only because I increased their potential. I didn't make them faster in two workouts. I increased their potential for speed because they trust their balance. So the purpose of these exercises relative to what Kevin would be doing in the golf swing, how does that translate? So you have these jumping exercises. Yep. How does that translate for them into what they're trying to do with their golf swing? So, if, so for example, uh, I mean, everybody's going to have a different need, but like if a balance need for us on short game that we worked on yesterday, uh, a gentleman had trouble, you know, trusting getting to his front foot. So I need to improve his trust and his stability here. You know, there's exercises down on the floor that it can improve his glute strength and his hamstring strength. But right there, live in a lesson, the way I address that is saying, hey, this muscle needs to help you. How do I get it to feel more engaged right here, right now? So I can put a band on his ankle or I could just have him jump. Uh, if I'm on the range and it's a large group setting, the jump is going to be a safer fix because we can do it right there. If we're in a one-on-one -on -one setting, I'll have a little more time. We'll dive a little bit deeper into it. But in order to get this glute to work, uh, I would need to increase the, the, the blood flow, increase the activation. So having them jump or hop down on the floor and do a bridge, those are the easiest ways to impact that goal right there. But every, every golfer is going to have a little bit of a different need. So I might, it, I addressed five different needs yesterday, but it was five different golfers. Well, like for this guy in particular, we, you know, and I've been working on with them like, to get his hips moved, but the way Kevin did it, he, he had him, he took a band. So, why don't you just lift your strong? So, if, if, if I was the golfer, he had the guy hold the band out here in front of him and just start to engage his head without moving everything else. Right? Yeah. So, so, he started, he, if he kind of did this the first couple of times, and then he would pull with his arms, and eventually he got into being able to move his hips this way, and then he went the other way and, and this that way. So, he we just kind of, it just kind of woke him up. And then he was still struggling with it. Kevin made a good point. The guy was a, a, a soccer player growing up. And then Kevin just said, well, it's like a little soccer kick. And the guy goes, oh, I got it. And all of a sudden he started, he was hitting a 54 degree wedge. When we started, he was swinging at a good, going about 80 yards. And two swings later, it was about 100. So the, the efficiency is what we improved there. Yeah. So for him, he didn't trust this. So he was adding other solutions, right? So he was he was like flipping at it and peeling away from it. And that's, we're gonna lose posture, we're gonna lose yards, we're gonna expose the edge. Nothing that you wanna see during a web session. So for him to improve his athletic ability to plant on one foot and rotate was just a thought. Now I had him actually air, you know, kick a couple balls, set up and same feel. And he was like, it was straighter and longer and, he flew, three, I think he flew three grand. I mean, he's a guy that struggled. We all see this move with a lot of our students who can't move. And he's just, he just started to get through it better and the consistency went way up. And so the only swing thought there was soccer kick. And it had nothing, uh, nothing more than the goal of improving his athletic ability. Yeah, so Kev took what I've been trying to teach him and just changed the, 
the, the awareness in his body a little bit to where it clicked. Um, something I never would have thought soccer kick, and and, uh, and it worked perfectly. Does this surprise you to see, even though you've been around this a long time, you've been teaching a long time, does this surprise you when you see Kevin work with somebody like that and, and get that result that quickly? I don't know about surprise because I've seen it before, but it's always interesting to me how, how just a certain cue like that can come up, come in and have that great of an effect. Like I expected him to hit it a little bit better. He picked up 20 yards for the wedge, which, you know, if I didn't see it, I wouldn't have believed it. Duff said he, oh, yeah, he picked up 20 yards, although I would have called PS on. There's no way. But but I saw it. So, it, you know, so it's, um, it's it, I don't know what surprises were, but it's always interesting. It's fascinating to me. To me because I, I understand how the body works, well, not to his level, but I get the idea of it. But when you bring in an expert and they explain it a little bit differently or cleanly, however, um, and the student connects with it, it's just an amazing transformation. And, and look, for me, it, it's, it, it enhances the lesson because that guy's going to come back. For another 20? For another 20. We're trying to be value add. Yeah. You're always trying to make, I'm always trying to make sure that the, the golf professional is highlighted from me being there because I'm trying to be a value add because I'm in, I'm in your house. If you're in my gym and you're bringing in a student, I'll, I got you. But if I'm coming in to your house trying to help you look better and help your client, it's only a value. I can only be a positive benefit to you if I'm a value add. So we're trying to make sure that like, hey, you know that drill that he is trying to get? Let's try a different thought or a different feel. And I'm always gonna be working feel versus real. <laughs> You will not be catching me trying to tell you how to square a plug fix because I'm still working on them myself. But I can definitely make your client feel more athletic, free, either free lesson, during a lesson, or hey, this is your homework. I think most, most everybody yesterday, I sent them home with three or four drills to do. And one of the drills for the junior kid was like, hey man, you can't show up to this start. You need to have food. So, you know, it, it might be something as simple as like one guy, one kid came in for a fitting and I was like, why is he down? And Kev threw him a bar. It was just like his numbers were down. And the kid was just hungry. So Kev, one kid showed up, played two basketball. He weighs 95 pounds. He played two basketball games and two cups, three sips of water. Three sips of water. And Kev, was, Kev didn't know. He just kind of kept his mouth shut. And then I brought him in. <laughs> Yeah, the kid, the kid was telling me, he was telling Kev about his workouts and why he was sore, tired, and injured. And Kev had not said what my purpose of being there in that day. So that kid just walked into an absolute buzzsaw. And Kev looking at me, I'm still just enjoying it. Just like this little kid has no idea what I do. So but, that was fun. But I think having a fitness professional in here, you know, everyone knows tour players have, they have a swing coach and a mental coach and all these different coaches. I think it, it adds value to the lesson. You know, not one client said, no, I don't want him here. They all engaged with Kevin. I think and I had, I got a couple of good feedbacks, I tell you. Right. A couple of good feedbacks after from from the actually the dads. Yeah, uh, good. I mean, we sent we sent one of the young ladies home with him. I was like, here, just take the program. Go. Go run with it. But I think she does. <laughs> you have to find somebody for us as pros, you know, we have to find somebody that we trust. I've tried this with other people and they start teaching golf and, and the fitness professor starts teaching golf, you're done with it, right? You're, just, and you're, you're a fitness guy, I'm a golf guy, swing guy. So finding some, I think it's important to find somebody local that, uh, that you can trust or to have a network of people. I've got people all over my area here that I trust that I can send them to and, they, and we coordinate on a, on a team effort. Not so much where they're here, which I like, but I can send them and say, you know, this is what they're working on. Do it. They send me videos. We can do it that way. And if you guys can find somebody, if you don't have somebody, find somebody that you trust. Um, I, you know, or you can bring Kevin himself. I'm going to try to use him some more and bring him in to do some things um, in the future. But it's just, it's just a, a way to help your members or your clients just get a little bit better faster. And, and it just keeps them coming back. Let's go through some of the him stuff. Okay, that we did. Cool. You want to use a um, uh, person or you want to use us? Let's use one of them. Okay. Who uh, would benefit from learning Shannon? You can't because you are our strength coach here. So I want to pick on somebody else. Um, who would benefit from some physical fixes? Anybody? I'm going to pick somebody anyway. I would. 
Okay. We, I think we all would like cool. Okay. Y'all should have gone on with Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was like a loaded question. Yeah. Everybody looked at me like, I don't want it. Um, all right. So uh, you want to go through uh, posture first? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, set up a, uh, I'm just happy to hold the club. I know this makes you feel more comfortable. So go ahead and stand and address. Okay. So there's, we all know that, uh, don't hit me. I've learned by hanging around golf pros that I need to mention that. <laughs> uh, that I walk into a lesson and they will say, hey, you know, go ahead and work with them. And then they'll from the back say, don't swing. Like, Why? Isn't that obvious? No. I got to mention it. More. Should I? Uh, please don't. Don't shin me. <laughs> They're already messed up. So for here, let's say he's uh, has slight C, right? So he's got a little bit of C character is fine. If we address a need, I'm going to start with big moves and then move into smaller pieces. So go ahead and set up. So right now he's pretty neutral, right? This isn't this isn't bad. I'm just going to pick on him a little bit, right? He's got a little bit of a little bit of rounding, and it's because he coaches for eight nine hours a day, right? But we'll see clients that will have worse posture on a regular basis. It'll either be too much knee bend, too much hinge at the hip, or too much shoulder. But for him, if I'm going to teach him how to set up, at no point in time am I stepping out of my realm and walking into, you know, your role by telling him, hey, man, we should hinge on every swing. So for for a, a on a range lesson on how to hinge, I have them set up an address. Go ahead and do it. And then from here, I'm just going to take, I think that's a seven iron, and I'm just going to have him slide his hands down further. And as he slides his hand further down the shaft, the weight is going to transfer into his heels and his hips. So right now he's loaded back here. I'll stand here so you guys can see me. So he's loaded in the hamstring. Essentially, if he drops that club, go ahead and drop it, and we put his hands by his side, he's doing a deadlift. So in order to encourage a comfortable position for him, he's got two options. He can stand up using his spine, which don't, or he can learn to hip extend. So from here, you're doing your deadlift, pull your hips towards the target and squeeze your butt. So now this muscle group and this muscle group were the most active. Whereas when I say deadlift, people panic and they think it's fine. So I can use my back extensors or I can use my hammies and my glutes. I would prefer you to hit the ball using your hammies and glutes for distance, for power and for durability. Um, but that's, that's the easiest one. So it's like, if I walk over, and Kev's like, hey, I've been working on this guy forever. I can't get his posture. Let's see what, what we can do to fix that. If we fix posture and I improve posture, nobody, nobody's going to hit a worse golf shot from better posture. It, it is a problem we do not see very often. I mean, we all know most shots are missed before you take it back. And, and getting somebody into posture that you don't get in turn so you can hit a shot that way. So get it, get, you just that again with them. And just getting somebody into the posture, when you see somebody, they're standing like this because they're at a desk or they're immobile, getting them back into this position just allows them to move better. Right? If, if John rounded his shoulders and went into that C posture, it's hard for your spine to move that way. So we're always trying to get people into this and then going through those exercises that Kev does just kind of trains them on how to feel it and do it. And it's something they can do on their own. And that's what we want. We want things that they can do on their own to improve. So when they come back to us, uh, we see a little bit of improvement and we can move on to the next stage because I can't get, if John wanted to get more speed, I can't get him more speed if his posture's out of position because he's going to lose the, the ability to move. You could, but you just hurt him. Right. <laughs> or he's going to compensate. He's going to compensate in some way, which is what we see. Yeah. So the biggest thing for, so I'm, I'm picking your posture, but I'm picking. That's fine. So from here, if this is a muscle group, let me turn, sorry. Um, if this is a muscle group that needs address, if we have him stand in the lesson and feel more engaged, so pull that band apart, let's do about 15 of them. Good. So there's two options he can pull from. As he pulls, he could start to round his back like this, which I want, or he could use the scaps back here to pinch. I always tell people to pinch a grape between the shoulder blades. So if he does 15 of those reps, and that is the muscle that is engaged and being used in the session, in the lesson, in the thing we're talking about, and then ask them to hit a ball. I'm not making him stronger, right? It's 
16 seconds of work. I didn't make them stronger. I made them more efficient, more aware of the postural need. Now, if he goes home and never does this drill again, will that continue, that, that problem still continue to happen? For sure. That problem will keep reoccurring. But if he goes home and said, hey, Kev, that one drill that you gave me with Doc on that session, I have been doing every day and my posture feels better. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel to get that done. So now address the ball with the, or sorry, yeah, stand in the dress. Do you, where do you feel more engaged? I feel more, I feel more upright yep. because my shoulder blades, I can feel those more like this, so more expansive in yeah. the chest. So a little more squeeze between the blades back here. Right, but that makes my chest feel like it's more open. Good. Good. I mean, if he is more he feels less less stress on it, it feels freer. Good. So it's going to be easier for him to create that rotation and that address problem that we're trying to fix. That's. Okay. That, I mean, those are two quick drills and not get hurt. But for that, so right there, that's the benefit. Just making John more aware of what he feels. He can stand up there. So now I can try to get him to do the movement that I want. It's hard to hard to get him to move from here. Where, but if I if he's opened up, now I can get. Some other things going, and that allows me to move to the next step. Thank you. No problem. Let's do one with the, the hips. Ah, okay. Um, let's do. Oh, the club. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh the rotation. Yeah, the rotation. Okay. So, um, everybody's. Or, um, I won't assume, but is everybody familiar with Tyler's performance TPIs evaluations? Everybody has anybody used them, or is everybody TPI certified? You are okay. Have you guys ever used them on in a session? Yeah, you have good. Like full screen, or you just kind of used a couple. Of them? Sometimes, like we're looking at the hips, I'll do the pelvis rotation. Perfect. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah, the, it's it's from an evaluation standpoint. Obviously, the evaluation has its bearing. When a golf professional does an evaluation and they give it to me, I'm going to redo it anyway. I'm going to check it. Um, I've done a million screens at this point. So I can run through it pretty quickly. But if you guys just see a couple of things that might be addressed and you run through two or three tests, the disassociation test is probably the, the best one. So when I'm uh, differentiating a internal turn versus slide and sway, I need to make sure that I'm actually encouraging this. So the big, the big point of emphasis actually kind of seemed like a theme yesterday is that we had a lot of trouble going to impact. We had a lot of trouble going to impact because they were trying to create speed and then come back to impact and kind of push the hip out, resulting with an open face and a couple other problems. So the drill that we gave the client yesterday is, is simple. I'm gonna engage the core, I'm gonna stand at address, and I'm gonna disassociate the hip. So we're not going to do anything more than activate the muscle groups that are required in, in what the feel should be. But I, I tell my people to put a little bit of bend into their club, which will help turn on their core. So now I'm standing at a dress, right? I'm gonna exaggerating a good neutral posture and I'm gonna engage a turn. Now, when I turn, that's a lot different than what they have been doing, right? So I'm putting bend on the club, my abs are on, and I'm gonna rotate towards impact. Now, impact is, is a little bit more comfortable for them, where I'm really going to make a bigger turn and engage more of their muscles and probably unlock some speed is in the back swing. So if I get them to rotate back, put bend in the club, and feel a turn instead of a push away from the target, right, away from the ball, off the ball, loss of posture, all other issues that come with it, I'm going to engage this group and then have them swing. And then if I see the problem fire up again, do the drill again. Keep going. If it fires up again, do the drill. Or I might need to, hey, I got to put you on the ground and have you actually learn that it's not student body right, student body left, which is, I see that a lot. And do you ask about injuries before you do that? Yeah. So generally, if somebody has like a, if somebody has a hip labrum problem or, you know, series of problems inside the hip or even an ankle or knee problem, that's going to limit how much we're able to do. 
But if they've never told you about it and we find out about it, it's going to be helpful for you to say, hey, with this limitation, this is the swing that's most effective for you. If I ask somebody with a knee issue to really clear their hip, it starts to put stress on that old knee injury that they had. We haven't really done them any service in a positive manner there. So when, when um, I improve the disassociation to the hip, I could introduce a different set of issues, but that's what I have a health problem. Because if I get more speed and more turn, and Kev now needs to tell you, hey, that open club face, that was okay for your old swing that you had. Now I need to address that open club face. Right. And we were in the, was it, one, it was the guy was closing, right? That was, uh, I think he left it open. Oh, yeah. So he was open. Was open. Yeah, he was open and we gave him more hip turn. So open with more hip turn is going to cause a different problem. But luckily I'm in a room where a guy can fix an open club face. Like that. So that, yeah. That's a good problem to have. Yeah, this was a guy yesterday who says he works out a lot. Yeah, sure. Started doing some of the exercises. One of them was pretty interesting. He said he was doing a squat on a post ball with the thrust. With the thrust. We're going, okay. And then Kevin goes, yeah, it was interesting because why don't you kind of go through the story? Yeah. Because that was so pretty fun. What you, and this is, a, this is a brain surgeon, highly intelligent, works out a lot. Thought he was doing the right thing, and well, God, yes. So, so we're trying to in. If I'm trying to work on triple extension, right? So if you get, um, if you get somebody with high potential for speed, they can jump. There's a high correlation between club head speed and vertical force production, right? We all know that. Um, lateral is always, you know, I, I test in my gym a 90 degree broad jump. I do want to know that we have lateral power. But I know that if I improve this vertical number, your club head speed is going to go up if I did nothing else, right? So we know that force production is important. Ground force reaction, there's a reason we all have foot sensors in most of our teaching bays or any of the teaching bays um, around here. When we go to create force, I can't have something underneath me that's going to take that away. The whole goal of a squat with a vertical drive or anything that pushes is to create force down. I'm not actually teaching you how to jump up as much as I am teaching you how to push down. If I teach you how to push down and use the floor, it'll translate into more speed, more power, all, all the other things that are sexy in the cell. But if I'm putting something underneath me, I'm taking away from the goal. So if he wants to stand on a BOSU ball and say he's working on his ankle mobility, fine, I don't care. It's no problem. If you want to stand on a BOSU ball or an AirX pad, or something else questionable, and tell me you're trying to work on creating force, I would say is inefficient. We've all seen kind of those swing videos of guys trying to mimic swing while in stocks on, on a, a wood floor, or my favorite is the one that always recirculates is a frozen pond. The guy says, play as you lie. And boom, it's his head on the, I mean, it's violent, but it's hilarious. What I don't want to see is you trying to create force and trying to make it less efficient. I'm trying to get you faster. I'm not trying to get you faster on a bosu ball with a kettlebell over your head on one. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's so I basically just worded it. I think I frustrated him. I, I worded him is what was your what is your goal in that exercise? And he said, I want to create more force. Well, I need you to get rid of the bosu ball. He didn't like that, but. Well, but he said force and he was working on stability. Yeah, force and stability. I said that was counterproductive in the yeah. manner you're delivering. It's one, or, one or the other. Yeah, yeah, please work on one thing or the other. But he was so one of the things when Kev got him to do this exercise, he actually started to go side to side first. And then he was like, Well, I'm going to turn. And then he started doing this. Well, what's wrong with that? Here? That was just a lot of knee. Right. He's using his knees instead of trying to brace his knees and actually move his hips. Yeah, we wanted his hip to cause the knee movement rather than the knee movement cause the hip to move. I don't want to teach a swing that looks like a really bad Elvis dance move, right? I need, I need the, oh, the look, the knee move. Well, duh, because the hip drove it. But if I just coach, uh, we were talking about this last night before, before 1990 something, it was yeah. Tiger was really jumping into that knee and kind of 
extending no. it, no. you're going to get hurt. But if I turn the hip violently, which a lot more people are doing, they're kind of just leaving that face where it is and getting the heck out of the way. They're creating a whole lot of power, but we're not coaching that. That's a hyperextension of the knee. And I mean, with somebody athletic, you might be able to get away with it for some time. But if you do that to one of your 52 year old weekend golfers, they might not be playing when they're 53. And so try, you know, try it with your students. Have them get up here and see how they can, you know, can they, can they actually, I didn't have them do it. Can they actually move? Uh, I'll have people. Pretty amazing what we'll see. I gotta turn your head. We'll start going. With this. <laughs> Creativity is awesome. <laughs> I, no, no, turn your head. Like, okay, I, and then they start going. Well, my hips are moving, and then so that, then you already know. You know now you know what the, the root of the problem is. They just don't have awareness. It's not that they can't move, but they're just not aware of it. So you gotta actually get get them in there and have them do some of these exercises to train them and find different ways. Sometimes you actually have to move them. You know, Kevin, you understand what you're saying? I'll get in there. First, I'll ask. Before I put my hand in, but I ask them. Okay. Touch it, Kevin. Yes, sir. And then I'll just actually move their hips for them and get them to go. And once they start to do it, then I'll just actually try to create a little resistance. Now, you go ahead and do it. Right, and I'll go the other way. So I'll just kind of hold their hips so they can feel it. And then I'll ask them, what are they feeling? I'm hoping they're going to say they actually feel the ground. Because in order to move your hips, you have to use the ground. And, and that that tends to, you know, like, like I'm looking at you, you go, what, really? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, if your feet are off the ground, you can't move your, you can't move your hips as efficiently. You may have seen Chris Como jumping off of a, a platform dive and trying to turn, right? Well, he went one way and his body goes the other way. So unless we have something stable on the ground to, to press against, yeah. your body can't move. So teaching people, get them to sit back up and then just adding a little bit of resistance will, will, will wake them up a little bit. He, he's got to use his feet now and that's going to help generate some rotation when you start getting rotation you start generating some speed you can get some vertical force um, everybody I was, how many of you get questions of how do i generate more lag i get that all the time well they're doing this to get lag problem is the more lateral they go the further back their arms and hands stay. they actually do the opposite they get more throw they need you know rotation helps generate lag. well you can't rotate unless you're being able to do this. So just teaching people to get their hips to move this way translates to the rest of the swing. And while we're on the foot subject, I was talking to every single player about the shoe wear. Two people had good shoes. The rest of people were in something air, something soft, something cushy, something super comfortable, which I get, I hear you. But we're trying to create stability and it's the same thing as me trying to stand on a BOSU. If you have high club head speed or you have balance problems and I add a squishy surface to stand on, I've just made it more difficult unnecessarily. So luckily the, the one girl that we worked on yesterday had good shoes and I said, oh good, she has good shoes on. I said, it's because I already talked to her about her other terrible ones. And so that, that problem luckily got solved. I, I use the analogy that most golfers can relate to is if I put you in soft sand, how fast can you swing? Versus if I put you on the on a concrete ground. Just kind of if you think about it that way, you're like, oh yeah, I can't swing very fast in a bunker, but I can rip it when I'm on the, on the ground. So what are you looking for in shoes? The one so I don't I don't have a shoe deal. But uh, the one that I've prescribed mostly are the Pro SL and the, um, what was the other one we were talking about the other day? Um, Echo has a stable shoe. Echo has a stable shoe. Um, uh, the G4, not the tennis shoe version. Yeah. And uh, what was the one that you looked at? The uh, Tor Alpha. Tor Alpha. Alpha. I, I look, I look, I did studies for on shoes for, for, Swing cat and for foot drill years ago. And there's three types of shoes. There's a very mobile shoe, it's a shoe you can just twist like this, like a sneaker. Very comfortable, yep. terrible for, for most golfers. Um, then there's a kind of a mid stability shoe like the Pro SL without the carbon in it. It's a little bit more stable than like the Tor Alpha, the really rigid shoe. So the more plastic the shoe has in the sole, the more stable it is. So golfers who have um, really flat feet or weak ankles tend to need a more stable shoe. Golfers who have really high arches or, or strong feet can use a more a, a less stable shoe. So, 
but most of the people that we deal with don't have great footwork. So they wear these shoes that are, you know, some of the shoes that, that don't have spikes are really soft and comfortable because they walk around in them, but they're, but they're reducing their performance. And I'll say, look here, you're, you can wear those shoes, but you're gonna swing at 90% of your potential. So if you wanna give up 90%, you know, if you hit it 200 yards, you're only gonna hit it 190. You know, because of the shoe, I can get you to hit a 200, 250, you know, as they go further. So the shoe there is important. Um, there, are other, there are other tests you can do because some people have bad feet and they need more mobile shoes or different things. Um, Tiger kind of brought it to light when he switched from the Nike shoe to the foot joy shoes right. because he needed a more stable shoe. What about the squares? I mean, squares are good. Yeah, I, the, the thing that you have to be mindful of is somebody had, like, let's say one of your golfers has a toe miss. Like they miss into their toes. If I add a, a shoe, I don't know if square fits into this category. I'm just kind of blanket statement. Um, but if they add a shoe that has like, you know, might look more platformed, that could be a problem for them. But if you have, yeah, so if, if you have like a real big deal, somebody tends to have a toey miss anyway. I've just, so that being said, the flatter sneaker that looks, more, you know, you know, flush to the floor is going to be more beneficial than if you have somebody with a toe. It's worth addressing. Hey, the shoe that you're wearing is currently assisting in your miss. Helping your problem is not good. So if somebody has ankle mobility issues, they actually might benefit from a softer shoe. So if somebody's got like really bad ankles, unstable, and we put them more stable footwear, it can make that worse. Whereas somebody who needs more balance, who doesn't have like a, if somebody has a high history of ankle uh, instability problems or mobility issues, then being in a softer shoe would be a little helpful, but they would probably be in that mid range. So most people shouldn't be playing in the, the comfy squishy ones. You brought up ankles. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, do you work on ankle exercises? Yeah, I mean, so uh, in order to improve your squat, if you have like poor ankle mobility, it needs to be addressed. Now, if it gets to a point where the ankle injury is beyond my scope of practice, I have physical therapists that I trust and work with. I, when it comes to physical therapy, you need a, a very active approach. If someone, if you see somebody time in and time out and they do the same exercise over and over and over again, and it's just playing from the script, you need to find somebody a little bit more engaged in actually getting you out of their office instead of having you would you like to sign up for 20 more sessions, sir? That's not your people. You want to get out of there. You want to show us a couple of good assessments for ankle? For ankle. So the easiest one is, uh, is it okay if I go on the wall? Yeah. Okay. So the easiest ankle mobility assessment, I, I actually have been pretty good here, is <clears throat> if somebody has a significant ankle problem and they put two fists away from the wall, they probably won't be able to get here. Right, they won't be able to flex the ankle forward. Now, if they don't, that's no problem. Let's, Kev, let's do that. It's hard to see here. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, so that's. I'll hold this up for the water. So, if they are two fists away from the stick, and they go to flex forward, and their heel already lifts, this is is a bad. They, they have bad ankle flexion. Right. You can also just take a look, you know, I don't expect you guys to be experts in feet, but if you look at somebody's ankle and every time they flex and extend, you see one good difference than the other, or they're consistently having a miss um, in, in their feet and you've already addressed the footwear, we might need to be asking, do you wear orthotics? Oh, this is just one I didn't talk about. But, um, if somebody wears orthotics in their everyday shoes and doesn't wear them in their golf shoes, that's a problem. They need to be in both because if you're committed to orthotics, you're an you either you're an orthotics person or you're not. It's not like driving glasses and then I don't need to wear them any other time. Like it's not that. If you're orthotics, wear orthotics. If you're not in orthotics, don't wear them. But the transfer from footwear, we actually had a long discussion about feet and use of the floor at dinner. Constantly learning. Now, I find if you have uh, some kind of a pressure mat, any of them, um, have them do have them stand in their shoes and then have them take their shoes off. And you'll need, you know, especially if they're on their toes a lot, and then you take their shoes off and they're not, it could be the shoes the problem. 
there was one brand of shoe, I won't say which one it is, but it had really thick high soles, a very popular sole shoe designed by a, probably one of the most popular golfers. And uh, every golfer that came in, I threw those shoes away because I, all, I, all, I found them all, they were like this at F7. Every single one of them. As soon as I put them into a flatter soled shoe, their balance went, got better and their speed went up. When I did testing for FootJoy, um, it was a program that FootJoy did with Sasha McKenzie and they had a body track set up and they tested everyone. I, I would just change people's shoes and they picked up three to four or five miles an hour. Just, it was in one swing. It's not like they were warmed up and then they swung. I would just change their shoe and the speed went up different. So I, that to me just proved right away that most people think of shoes as clothing, right? You, you buy a pair of shoes because they look good and they feel good. But shoes are equipment. You need to get fit for your shoe just like you get fit for your clothes. Has anybody heard the story about, I mean, John rom has been very apparent. He's obviously works with Dave Phillips, TPI model, and they've all talked about that. Has anybody heard the story about his shoes? He did? Or his foot. So his foot, is, is, he's got an ankle mobility problem. People are like, oh, he's got a short back swing. Actually, his separation is massive. But when Dave Phillips was looking through his TrackMan data, he said, hey, what happened on Wednesday? And John says, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, normal stuff. He's like, did you do your workout before or after that swing session? He said, before, like normal. So John works out before, then goes to the range, emails David's track man numbers, have a nice day. Something happened. He says, what happened here? They found out that John forgot his cleats. So John used his golf shoes or his workout shoes in that session on turf. So John in the session on turf used those shoes and his numbers went up. Now for a, John, a guy like him to gain two, three or four miles an hour is massive. We're not talking about 90 to 92 miles an hour. Before. That's, we're talking 118, 120, they're up there. So when that happened, they went to the shoe company and was like, make this, which was a, like a Kobe Bryant basketball shoe, make this in a golf shoe. Yeah, it's what he plays. It changed. Yeah. I don't think I broke so just, It's just, just little things that we could do and notice as to help our students. You can't buy a game, but you can make them increase their potential just by changing, just like you do a club fitting. You know, if a club's too heavy, they're not going to swing it fast enough. Or, or if a club's too light, you're going to struggle finding the face. So we just little things that we can do to help help our students get a little bit better and just noticing. One of the reasons I really like Kevin, we talked about the same thing at the presentation last year um, because we're both kind of into, into the footwear. Because my feeling in, in teaching, you know, getting a pressure plate in 2006 changed my teaching because it opened up my eyes to things where if I changed their foot, the way they use their feet, it immediately changed the way they use their body and, and the swing changed. And that's kind of when I kind of went down that rabbit hole researching all that stuff. The, the process of making a person more athletic will improve their golf game more than anything else in a, in a short or, or long period of time. It's my job, you know, in the session, or if I get a referral from you guys, is to hand you back a more athletic golfer. If I hand you back a more athletic golfer with larger potentials, I'm giving you a better product to work with. Also, in that same regard, kind of on the other end of it, if somebody has an injury and I'm able to point out to you that that swing move that you are asking them to do is not is going to drive you nuts because they're probably never going to do it. If you want their wrist to look like they're in a waiter position and they have torn ligaments in their wrist and push-up position is uncomfortable for them, it's not going to happen. We either need to get physical therapy or we need to find a different fix. But if it's working with a team and I'm able to tell you that without saying, Hey, Kev, that's not going to work because there's other obviously helpful ways to deliver that information and make it look, you know, wholesale. But the that will alleviate issues for you to make your lesson be more efficient and stop working on the same problem over and over. Remember that posture we talked about? Yeah, I'm trying to address that. So it's maybe we'll work on something different, you know? Yeah. Any questions out there? From anyone Not yet. Okay. Cool. Um, do you want to do um, some of the swing stuff or you want me to go through that? 
Yeah, why don't you go through your okay? Cool. All right, so I put together a, a brief presentation. And so the presentation uh, will be elaborating more on, on what we said. So I, I covered a good bit of it, so I might skip a touch. But so the concept that we're trying to improve on is improving athleticism. So from that perspective, the, the problem in golf fitness is that golf fitness has become more complex than it needs to be. So this is a famous picture that was put all over, I believe, Golf Digest at one point in time. That's real. Right. And it goes against everything I just said. But guess who's standing on the ball? It's Dustin Johnson. Everyone, I automatically got him. You think I'm dumb and he's smart because he, it's, he's Dustin Johnson. And he hits it 290 with a two iron. And, you know, now I'm fighting an uphill battle. Luckily, that's a really old photo. So the concepts that we're trying to do are to uncomp. So the problem I have is that most of the time, I have people coming to me and they have out their phone already. And I'm like, oof, we're in trouble. <laughs> because, hey, look at this swing. I'm like, yeah, that's great. That's great. Have you been training that swing since you were nine? No, because Rory has. You can't copy it. But I can improve your athletic ability and make a more athletic version of Kev or a more athletic version of Shannon instead of trying to make you fit into Rory. So you trying to fit somebody into Roy swing is reckless, right? You, unless they have that amount of hip turn and separation for that small a human, it's, you're going to hurt the person, most likely. So for me, my goal is to uncomplicate things. So if I'm starting pulling out graphs, we're all in trouble because I'm not good with math. But I am good at communicating on how we can make that athlete more efficient. So this is one of my first clients. Our first client, Greg. Greg in this photo is 55 pounds down. So he came to me with the craziest golf goal you'll ever hear, right? I want this amount of club head speed and I want it in this amount of time. And it was like 12 in like two days. I was like, not happening. It's not happening, Greg, but we can improve. And along the way, the real results that Greg really wanted, you want to lose weight, you want to feel better, you want to play more golf. So by having him come in and see me and improve his athletic ability, instead of him getting frustrated and walking on a treadmill after 15 minutes into his workout of trying to do some slider push-up, some BOSU ball squat, and improving his frustration and not improving his golf game, I took him and I dialed it back and said, let's make it look nothing like this and simplify the process. So the goal is, to never have somebody go out of their lesson having these type of swing thoughts. Right? If, they're, if you leave the swing lesson and you've got 97 different things to work on, both you and I have all failed that guy or girl. But the end goal is this, so senior club championship. The guy's older, he wants to win, he's sick of losing to his friends. How do I get him to work that? How do I get that goal achieved as efficiently and as fast as possible? The way I do that is have them train closer to what a athlete would need than to what he wants to mimic or an athlete. It makes no sense for me to take tour truck training and put it into his living. It has no bearing, no, no, no correlation other than the fact that they both play the same sport. And we both know Rory and Greg are playing different sports. They both address a white ball and I might say, Taylor made, but it's it's not the same game. So the concepts are carrying over throughout sports. So when you talk to a young kid yesterday, he plays basketball. His dad was talking about, oh, is he doing too much? I said, well, yeah, he's had like four games today and a slice of pizza. That's not enough. But I don't want that kid to stop hooping because if he continues to cross people over, change direction, and create more force and jump and speed – it'll carry over to his golf game because if he decides that he wants to specialize in golf when he's 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, that's fine. But I still would never encourage him to not in the winter play basketball. When people come in and you all have seen it, they're saying my kid specializes in golf and they aren't even on their second set of clubs yet. If you've got problems, you might have a client that's going to be in quite often, but you've got other issues coming up. So Across the board, right, we have Brooke Henderson who played hockey. We've got, you know, Woodland who played basketball at a high level. 
he got Cameron Smith. I don't know what sport he played, but <laughs> at the end of the day, which golf, like which person are you closer to training? Are you closer to training somebody that golfs like Tom Brady or is it Tiger Woods? Right? Who, who's, who are you closer to? Tom? Yeah, I, I would say so. Good. Not that go. There we go. But we're closer to working with this guy. So we're closer to working with somebody like this. So my goal would be to train him to be more athletic. General carryover between athleticism is going to be more prominent than general carryover of tour truck. So I say tour truck because, yes, the players train year round. And sometimes I only see somebody in season. Now, if I see somebody in season as an older coach now with bills to pay, I don't scare them away saying, I should have seen you months ago. I'll start with where you're at. But if you can encourage your people, especially since we're in New England, to train heavier in the off season and then don't fall off the ship, that's great. If they are starting directly before the golf season, make sure that they are with somebody who understands the golf game and the needs because I, it doesn't take any education or skill to make somebody really sore. So if you blanket, just hand somebody to a personal trainer who specializes in bodybuilding, they could have some improvements, but it would get in the way of the fact that I need them to be more athletic. I need them to be more athletic and, oh, they should lose weight and get some muscle definition along the way. So be careful of where we're prescribing our golfers, especially if they're older or injured, to send them into a gym with some gung-ho 22-year-old who might not understand golf as a, as a need would be risky. That's why Titleist has a uh, lead generator. Uh, search golf fitness near me or have me find you something. But the whole concept that we're trying to improve on is the athletic ability to play more like happy and less like fit. No, I'm just kidding. But we try to pick exercises that are uncomplex. Like, I don't even know what this device is. I have no idea what it is. But as soon as I get to drills that are actually going to address the needs of posture, balance, and hips, it's not a complex list. Nothing on there, you don't know what it is. All right, the deadlift, we already talked about, right? It's a hip hinge. Um, a pull-up variation. So there's band rows, there's TRX rows, there's band pull-aparts. We've already done three of them today. And then from a balance, lateral hops and jump ropes. I don't need you to invent the wheel. You can prescribe that to anybody. You don't need, you don't need to have my sports background to tell people, hey, your balance is poor. You should learn to jump rope. That's not a something that's outside of your scope of practice or anything like that. Like that. But if we learn to step up and do a lateral lunge, a jump, a jump rope, do carries, pull-ups, and deadlifts, you're going to have a better golf. You're going to have a better golfer because all of that is addressing a baseline athletic need to improve. So, we have three questions. Uh, so, from uh, Elliot Johnson, a passive massage device has become common in the I.e., you know, Theragun. Mm -hmm. right? Is there a warm up or a muscle group that you would recommend the golfer focus on prior to playing or practice? Do percussive massage before or after? Is that the end of the? Well, the, the question is, is you know, he mentions percussive being the you know, with their yeah, yeah. device. But is there a is there a five minute warm up? Like if I came to you and yeah. I have a warm up routine, yeah. five or ten minutes. Yeah. Because everybody runs to the first tee. A lot of people don't get balls. Yeah. So generally, when I come to everybody's club and I run a clinic, the thing I leave them with is that. So I also have a YouTube link as well. I can drop that. But the um, thing I end with and cap off with before I walk off of the range coaching everybody is a five-minute warm-up routine. I call it the T-box. Uh, the T-box warm-up, you should be able to prep your body physically uh, on the T-box using a club more so than popping a trunk, pulling up a driver, and doing a couple of you know, wiggles, one of these, and go. Um, most of the time, um, when clients come to me, they're not paying me to guess. So I figure out what warm up they need and I'm very specific. So I'm working with golfers at all levels. So everybody from a college golfer who's traveling to a guy going on a buddy's trip, he's not paying me to guess what his warm up should generally be, but I also have the max's version. But generally, everybody's going to need a little bit different. We were kind of talking about this. Um, the other night because each person's 
uh, each person's warm up is going to address a different need. So some people like to walk onto the tee, first tee, like ready to go. So for example, Adam Hadwin walks out onto the first tee, like basically in a, in a sweat. Whereas some of the other golfers will walk out in kind of more yoga, more zen. So we'll figure out what that need is. Um, and then some people just need to get the jiggers out. So it might be a job. It, it could be as simple as that. But should everybody have a specific warm up for them? Yes. Do we have stuff that will address a need from balanced posture, hips, um, and you know range of motion on the first tee box? Yeah, we can do it. Um, but if you're only giving yourself five minutes to prepare for a round, your expectations should be different than they probably are. That uh, I think that answered a very long-winded version of that. We like long. We like long. <laughs> All right. So. Uh... You mentioned balance, positive and hips. Is there any kind of order of how you address them, understanding the domino effect? Um, would you start at the, do, when you're doing this, your assessment said, do you start at the ground up or do you start at the head down? I'm going to try not to use the term it depends. Uh, but it depends. I would say posture is probably the easiest fix of the, of the big problem. Um, so if you're like I said, gun to the head, can't pick one, I'd probably go posture first, then balance, um, and then hips. But to say like one thing is more important for everybody would be inaccurate. Could you demonstrate uh, for the audience, what are a couple of the postures that you don't want to see? Oh, okay. So uh, this camera? Yeah. Okay. So we have C curve. Right, so C, rounding the shoulders. I'm giving you a pretty exaggerated version of it. This is probably more, more likely that, you know, less tilted. You've got S, which I'm really good at demonstrating because I used to have it. Yeah, yeah, you like that? Okay, so S curve and then neutral posture. So SC, uh, neutral, I, I found that you can play golf uh, I mean, most effective is neutral. C, you can get, get away with. S is going to be a very limiting. You're going to have a lot of like, if you're an S, you're likely to see a heel lift because it, they can't. It, there's only so much room in the spine uh, before your hip's going to say, we're done playing. Uh, reverse spine angle and S posture are probably your two bugaboos that are going to shorten your length of golf. And this would be addressed for both cabins. Um, do you see a lot of people getting into posture with their spine versus their hip joints? Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, it's easier to do. Yeah. It's, a, mm, I'm more likely to, you know, walk down the road and some, watch somebody bend over to pick up a box like this than I am for them to know how to properly hip hinge. But that's, that's my job. So the hip hinge posture is what we're looking for. Yeah, it's C is most, common because it's easier to like fall, like fall into. Yeah, it's yeah, easier to fall into yeah. a seat. Yeah. They, don't, they don't bend from their head, so they just kind of, you gotta bend from somewhere. So they're, they're gonna do it from their from their waist up here and just kind of get over this way. Uh, going back to the other thing about posture, I always start with the feet because I find the feet affect the rest of the body. So if they're, if they're out of balance, it's, it's harder to get into a good posture. And what are you looking for, Kevin? balance uh, posture. I just look at feet. Well, I use my pressure plate for all my lessons, but I'm just looking for where the center of pressure is on the feet. Is it in their, on the outside, the insides? Most people come in on their toes, so they're leaning forward. So then I go to, well, is it their shoe or are they just too far from the ball or what is it? And then, then I, I'll find, I'll get them into their balance on their feet first and then show them how to get into their posture second, correctly. And as far as the balance when they're on your force plates, where where are you seeing the pressure? Somewhere around the the instep of each foot between the heel and the, the ball of the foot. I like to see it right about where the arch of the where the arch meets the ball of the foot. All right. And so it's a little bit more towards the toe side than the heel side. All right. Um, I don't like it in the heel because your your pressure moves on your feet. It's dynamic, it doesn't stay in the same place. Some people think, well, I start in here and I have to go back into my heel. No, your pressure should never get into your heels. If it gets into your heels, you're done. You're back like this. So you can't push off of your heels. 
I just have to, you know, try to try to stand on your heels and jump. It's not very easy. So, so the pressure starts in the ball of your foot. When you go back, it moves towards your heel, but it's still in the middle of your foot. And then it goes towards your left toe and then moves back. So it's dynamic. It's not always in one place. So I'll, I'll always start there with, the, with that. Um, if you don't have a, a pressure plate or a force plate, you just put them on two inflatable pads. Because they'll, they'll get on there immediately, but they're going to fall, they're going to fall over. And then they'll learn how to stabilize and then take them off the pads and put them back on. And it's always interesting that when you put somebody on pads and you, it kind of wakes up their feet and the little muscles in their legs. And when you put them on the ground, like, oh, it feels like I'm gripping the ground. And it's, I get that every single time. And then you put them back on the pads. And the first time their, their feet are moving around this way. And the second time move a little bit less. And the third time they actually kind of, they learn it. You also find where they're unstable because some people will, will be unstable this way. And some people will be unstable this way. The people that are unstable both ways, then you got a bigger issue. But uh, but but they'll a lot of it's just not learning, right? Your feet are basically on shoes all day. The shoe helps support it. So people should walk around. We talked about this. You need to walk around without shoes. Hit balls without shoes on a lot. Learn, wake up your feet a little. Bit. Right. Yeah, so, I, I talked to just a quick note there. If Kev says swinging your heels is dead, that's totally fine, and I agree. And then it'd be on me. So like sometimes when when someone's in their toes. I tell them to get in their heels, knowing damn well they're not going to get there. So I give them a different cue and a different thought, like just to see if it, hey, Kev, I told them to stand in their heels. And when he looks at the force plate, he can be like, okay, they're actually in the middle of the pool. That, that worked, we're good with it, and we'll move on. Now, uh, one of the questions goes to back was the, there are um, high energy transfer orthotics. Oh, yeah. Have you heard of those? Yep. And if so, do they have any impact on speed for players? For sure. Like being vertical, of course. Yeah, they could. They're also, they're, um, check out some of the long drive guys. They're pushing some of those products um, and they are pretty effective. I haven't personally used them with any of my players, like from a, like if somebody had a foot problem and a speed problem, I think that might be something that we would address. Right now, from the perspective of those high impact orthotics, I don't, I have one long drive client and he's already using them and he was already using them before he got to me. He's getting good results and asking if we should change them. I'm, I'm not messing with those. So um, could they be impactful? Yeah, but if I'm getting a device to put in my shoe to address a speed need, I'm probably missing the other things that are actually causing that problem. But if you are addressing those and you want to tinker around with that, I don't think it's a bad idea. But if you're already like, yeah, it would, it could address a need, but I don't think it would be the, it wouldn't be my first choice. So. All right. And then uh, we're going to be going into season here in another six to eight weeks. As far as in season workouts, mm -hmm. uh, obviously you trained a lot of players at all levels, you know, professionals down to amateurs. What type of in-season workouts do you have your players do? So my biggest thing that I really harp on all of my clients is I don't need you to in-season get stronger. You're just trying to not get weaker. So if you think of training, there is going to be a strength phase. There's going to be a power phase. There's going to be a hypertrophy phase. There's all these different phases. And I, I go through these phases throughout the season. But in an in-season phase, when we are trying to peak for, when's club championship around? August. Okay, so if I'm trying to peak in August and they are training with me all winter, all spring or whatever, I'm trying to peak them in August. So at that point in August, if they have stopped training because the season started, by the time August hits, they are weaker than they were when they started in the spring. They're weaker, they're shorter, more likely to get injured if they stopped training, if they kept training, we wouldn't lose. Whereas the worst case scenario, well, worst case scenario is like dead stop. But when I see people in season, or sorry, out of season, start, stop, get, you know, lesser results and then start up again, it's, it's better than not training at all. But stopping training will be detrimental. So in-season training, I'm trying to maintain. 
So maintain your current numbers, maintain your current strength, maintain your current club head speed. And then when I'm trying to increase stuff or make it bigger, faster, stronger, and potentially dealing with more fatigue that's done in the off season. If you get somebody who wants to come in the spring, you just have to start them a little slower because they'll be dealing with their playing and I'm reintroducing exercise. So that's like the toughest balance, but I'm about to get a flood of those people. So we know how to do it by now. So uh, at the PGA show, there seemed to be a lot of compression products. Okay. And we had talked about this earlier. Their body's coming out with a number of products that uh, they're bringing to market or already in market. So could you explain to us why the compression products work? Yeah, so uh, it starts to recirculate blood flow. Uh, whereas if I'm, you know, worse than, you know, you see and hear of people who, if they stand with walkout legs, will pass out. It's, it's a blood flow thing. So if I, if I add circulation to uh, a tissue that has been under stress, it's basically like trying to take beef jerky and bring it back to steak, which is a similar comparison to muscle. It's a little nasty to think of, but it's true. When you uh, are recirculating the blood flow and getting it, it, it back engaged and, and getting some compression, it's also similar to what you would be getting from a massage. So I'm getting the blood circulation and I'm getting the massage effects. Um, and it's also been shown in other sports and it's just making its way into golf now. They've been using it in cycling and running and you know Olympic weightlifting for years and years. We've been doing it before. It just hasn't made its way. Compression has, hasn't made its way to mainstream golf like it is now. Like I used to never see a Theragun in a, in a pro shop. And now it's like Theragun bought real estate on the whole right side of the wall. And Kevin, you mentioned you have uh, compression products for your children who are athletes and compete. Yep. Could you explain to the audience uh, what you do and what they do when they're, they're competing and traveling? Because one of the Kevin's associate, Shannon, mentioned that uh, she uses it for recovery. Yeah, that's what, so both my kids, even the kids of two golf professionals, they both play tournament squash. If you play squash, you know how demanding it is on your leg, the training of it is, is, uh, is intense. So um, after, their, after their matches or their games, they'll sit in, and we have a different brand, the Norman Tech, they'll sit in there for 20 to 40 minutes just, just for recovery because they've got to play game in a couple hours. Um, and it's a, you know, they're, they're playing hard for 20 to 30 minutes running around. And then so the, the Norma Tech, um, just like Kev says, it just, it just helps bring back their increases their blood flow because their legs get tired and, and just kind of gets them more springy. So it assists in age recovery. Just, yeah, that, that, and obviously they're hydrating as they do it. So they don't become deep jerky. Yeah. It also fights uh, lactic acid buildup. Yeah. Lactic acid is lactic acid is what uh, people say like oh I feel the burn. It's so these would be good products for us to participate in the usage of since we're on our feet all day for sure six so, seven days a week. Yeah, they're yeah. great. I use them at the end of every day almost but during the summer when I'm teaching all day. Also a great way to relax. Kick your feet up yeah. literally, and you could have your beverage of choice. You, you, yeah, Pro, start with water. Got to hydrate. <laughs> Please start with water. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. All right, so let's go back to your. Uh, all right, yeah. so um, exercises that we would need uh, is where I was. So uh, deadlifts. A lot of times I say deadlift, people kind of panic. You know, they kind of see this guy, right? That's Eddie Hall. That's over a thousand pounds. The deadlift requirements from this are not what I'm talking about. You could get, you know, you could definitely get stronger from them. As soon as you get to a training load that's uncomfortable, uh, we're losing um, focus on the goal. Whereas the deadlift, this is a single leg version. I'm using golf. So if I teach somebody to deadlift, like I said deadlift, someone says, I can't deadlift. Uh, I have a bad back. Now think about just continuing to do what you do without addressing the problem of having a bad back. That should scare you more than me teaching you that exercise. That's not that scary, hard, difficult. We can do it in here and it can be effective for improving his balance, his hip hinge, his balance, um, and his, his balance into his hamstring and his glute. And for that specific client, he had a balance and a hip problem. So this exercise is perfect. He should do it. Don't be scared of the deadlift. Now, 
this is a, a dual dumbbell deadlift. It's done in the weight room. We've got 35 pounds there. It's not a high demand. In order to increase your ability to uh, be comfortable at impact, I need to be strong here. If I do nothing else with our golfers other than improve their balance and their deadlift, I don't know why I would address other needs, but this one drill alone will have a carryover throughout every single shot. They'll be more comfortable on their pitches, their putts, more confident and stronger over every driver. If we do nothing else other than improve their strength, their balance, and their confidence in every swing, we will have a carryover and have a more athletic golf. Now, the other posture demand I, I prescribe is this, this exercise uh, called a posture band rep. So in that drill there, I've got, a, I've got a, a heavy tension band. I say heavy because as uh, humans, we are designed to pull. We're designed to pull into us. So for example, if you were to do a press versus a pull, your body's potential for force is much stronger on pull. So don't, you know, this band for a pull apart on the range is great. But this band, as far as a band pulling exercise, isn't going to hit the demand until maybe your 30th rep. So to increase the posture, I'm going to dress as if I'm at a wedge, and then I'm just lowering it a little bit more, and then I'm pulling those scaps back, pinching that shoulder, and then I'm addressing that knee to improve neutral spine. So posture band row is one of my go-to drills. It's in every single one of my programs. I tell people once they're in you know, their second week of training with me, they're going to get this drill. They're going to learn this drill. It's not going in. So uh, deadlift. Uh, sorry, dead, oh, wrong direction. Deadlift, posture row, and then carries. So everybody has a need to carry. We are lifting things, we're pulling stuff out of our bags, we're walking around. But the carry that's most prominent to us would be a lopsided carry. Because in order to increase your speed, I need to increase your brakes. If I took Kev through training, and all I worked on was speed with him. That's it. That's it. That's the only thing I addressed is like a blind speed diagnosis. And all I did was over speed training, jumps, and all these other plyometrics that would increase his force. I wouldn't address his brakes. Now, the brakes, meaning his obliques or his hips, would stop that from breaking down. It would be like if I took a golf cart, I put a Ferrari engine in there, and I didn't address the brakes. I'm going to you're going to crash. So carries address a need um, for uh, brace, breaking down, and then balance. So posture, balance, hips. The need for balance, people think it's, it's like this. But in order to get that pose, I just need to jump. So in order to be able to create force, I need to be able to control force. So if I'm going to create force here, I need to be able to create some space between, but I need to balance. So if I increase your distance of your jump, but I don't increase your balance and your ability to land, then I haven't addressed the real need. So if I address my balance need, I will address a jump and I will address a load into your hip. So from there, I'm loading into my hip. I've got one weight at a time and I'm loaded heavy into my right hip. So I'm a left-handed golfer, but bear with me. When we load into our right hip, I'm gonna learn where the weight should go. So if I go out to the toe, I'm not addressing the need to load into the hip. And on every lesson yesterday, Kevin mentioned loading into the hip. You probably mentioned it on every single lesson as well. If they're addressing that need with me, hopefully it becomes easier for when they get to you. So this is a lateral lunge. I chose a kettlebell, but if somebody is losing their posture, they would need to be able to do this drill without any load first uh, to get into the hip. It's also an easy way for you to tell somebody an over-exaggerated feel in your teaching bay. So if you tell them, just step to the side, put your weight in your heel and load into your hip. If you have them do 10 of those, the muscles that they need to do this have just been engaged, been activated. And if anything, it's, it's, a, it's a different mode of communication. So if you're always giving them visual or you're always giving them audio, and maybe it's somebody you don't wanna go hands-on with for whatever reason, 
that's a tactile cue. So there's your tactile cue for information. So it might be just touching a different touch point to get the information across that you've been, you know, hey, I gave you the visual, didn't work. Gave you the audio, didn't work. Showed you on video, didn't work. Try a lateral step up, try a lateral lunge. You feel your hit now. And if they're not getting it at that point, then you've got some breakdowns. You might need to use somebody like myself to, to get them to use the muscle group, but to get them to learn that drill, to help on the force plate, you can even so see you're loading your hip now. You know, look at the force plate. So lateral lunge there, and then step up. So everybody steps. Walk. Uh, you know, I already done three sets of stairs today. So every single person can do a step up. That is a flexion and extension of the hip. Flexion and extension of the hip happens on every swing. So stepping up on a box from forward position to post position is an exercise that will address hip and balance. So I'm trying to uh, attack drills that are effective, super simple to execute, and are productive instead of counterproductive, like trying to squat and thrust on a BOSU ball at the same time as I've got a speed stick over. So the drills, right? Yeah, it, I've seen it. I just showed you a picture of Dustin Johnson trying to swing on a physio ball, right? That's a real photo. So posture, Right, we've got deadlift, we've got pull up, and we've got carries. Balance, we've got jump rope, lateral hops, keeping this list super simple. And then for hips, we've got lateral lunge, step up. There's other drills, obviously, to expand upon, but as far as your ability to point people in the right direction, this is a really strong start. Um, the reason I've left some push exercises off here is because it, 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 may not address a posture need and I may reinforce it. So I have, I've got plenty of clients that, you know, come to me and say, Hey, I work out all the time and their workouts are all forward facing push-ups, bench press, uh, seated quad extension. So I basically trained this half of my body and their sport has this demand with a high demand on posterior chain. So someone's doing push-ups. I'm not going to say no, but I feel like it was worth addressing that push-ups are not on the list because it may not address their, their real needs. Um, now, the, the reason we talk about fitness and how it can differentiate, differentiate between one client and another is that when I'm playing around that last three, four, five, six on a really slow day, not a sleepy hollow, right? No. no. So when we're playing around and I'm more durable than the people I'm playing against, my likelihood of beating them increases. So if you need to sell fitness to one of your clients, talk to them about the problems that may occur for the, them against their playing partners on the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th hole, that they may be able to separate themselves by making sure that they're not having those problems. Now, one of my clients here, uh, he improved his yardage on his first tee shot in two months. We improved his work because his balance was a big, big issue. Now his balance was a big issue because he didn't trust his his uh, his his shoes. He didn't trust his feet. He didn't trust to use it. So we didn't do too much. But in two months, we went from 242 to 282. We also went from a, a, a bogey to a par. And that was on the 17th hole for the same course two months out. So the goal there for him is to improve his athletic potential. Did I make him a monster in the weight room in two months? Absolutely not. I improved his athletic potential, which made him more comfortable to go after a ball. So when they come up to the, the last couple of tee shots, they've got a, a hole that looks like this. I've got an older client that I'm, I'm, I made this example for. His Playing partners need to pull hybrid to hit a 208 green, uh, usually has wind. He's got water short. He's got bunkers all over the place. It's a terrible, it's a tough part three. He needs to hold the green. His playing partners are tired and hitting hybrid. He has iron because he's not tired anymore. And his wedges, or sorry, his numbers have changed. So the equipment can't be the thing that we fall back on if our body lets us down. So the whole goal in incorporating golf fitness is to have you be le less reliant on your equipment, less reliant on your 
you know, the gear that you just upgraded and be more reliant on upgrading your physical skills so that when you tap into those physical skills, they're not giving up. So the whole goal of incorporating golf fitness into your routine, either with yourself or with your clientele, is so they can increase the differential between the people they play against. The people that they are playing against, if they are not training, are at a massive disadvantage to somebody who is training. And even more so, I talked about it last night, but it's even more uh, of a differential in the female golf game. It's the female golfer who is training versus the female golfer who is not training. That differential is massive because of the distance barrier that they might see. So basically I show you a picture of a snap driver so that you aren't mad that the driver didn't get you where you need to go and you spent the time on working on your physical needs rather than trying to upgrade to a brand new driver. There's, uh, there's the presentation on why fitness can make a large difference in your players and your own game. Yeah, perfect. So, I think, oh, I don't have anything else. That's just, I'm sold. I can say <laughs> So, uh, Kevin, do you do seminars, you know, not uh, so much seminars like this, but let's say if we put together a group of golf professionals and came to you, uh, because I think the, the golf professional's biggest challenge today is much like, you know, Kevin Sprecher has recognized is, is getting somebody fit, more fit for golf. And you having golf specific exercises, you understanding the golf swing, you being a, a player yourself. So do you do seminars to train golf professionals what to look for? Not to, to become fitness instructors, yeah. but you know, to, to introduce them to some programs and uh, I would say maybe provide them screening measures yeah. by which to understand their players better. Yeah, so what I've been doing is I've been traveling to other clubs to step onto the range with the teaching pro. There's two different ways you can do it. You can do it individually or you can do group-based. The group-based version allows me to touch more people and teach them uh, what, what physical ailments may be causing what, what miss. And then from that standpoint of how do I address it right here, right now, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, it's a little bit more specific to, hey, this miss, this population, this exercise. But from a perspective of how I teach my golf professionals, how to reiterate this information is TPI obviously has a great model on what they can expand. But what I found that if I teach you these three tests are going to impact the most of your clientele and how you can incorporate that into your everyday teaching, that is where I've seen a, the biggest benefit of people incorporating fitness or movement into their own teaching. But as far as going in and teaching people why it's important and then how we can incorporate it into your club as a whole, it's probably my most enjoyable thing that I'm currently working on. Yeah, because it seems to me that like if, if Kevin Sprecher is going to be working with me, then I've got to provide him somewhat of a framework to work with. You know, so if I don't have proper hip hinging or if I can't stand on one leg with balance, if I have no stability, then there's only so much he can do for me. And I think that's a that's a link that most students that we work with don't understand is how important their body is in the process. Yeah, I think that the, the uh, we're trying to address too much uh, without really diving into the root of the problem. Like if Kev looks at somebody and they say, hey, I need club head speed or uh, they have a different problem they come to him and he's smart enough to tell them like, hey, that's not that's not a, a, a problem we can solve right here. Rather than have no solution, be like, call Kevin, go see a physical therapist for that messed up shoulder. But to not address the actual root of the problem, you can duct tape it as much as you want, but yeah. you might not fix the real root. I mean, I can only get somebody as good as their body allows you to get them. So if they can't bend, turn, twist properly or whatever, then they're, they're, they're limiting their potential. Where if I tell you, okay, here's where I want to get you to, but you need to be able to do this and this, go see Kev, get working on it, and we work together. They're just going to, they're going to see that the potential is going to go up. Right. And because I want players to play pain-free, not get injured, but I want them to play more. So we all want to grow the game of golf for that. I want people to play more golf. Grow the game. So if they feel better, if they feel stronger at the end of the round, you know, they're going to be able to play. 
one of the uh, conversations I had at the show was with a friend of mine, Bernie Najar, who Kevin knows very well. Bernie was the Middle Atlantic PGA Section Feature of the Year. He's also coached to a number of tour players, both Corn Ferry PGA Tour, and most notably Kyle Berkshire, who was a World Long Drive Champion. And one of the things that Bernie was talking about is he sees that there's too much emphasis on gaining speed these days. And he says he gets people coming to him all the time because of his relationship with Kyle and, and Ryan McCormick, who is a long hitter on the Foreign Ferry Tour. And he said, speed training in and of itself is ruining a lot of players that he sees because mm -hmm. he said, now I'm 10 to 15, 20 miles an hour faster by using the various devices on the market. But he says they've lost contact because they don't have a body that can absorb that speed. And he, he referred to, he says, most people don't know how to break yep. in order to, to use the speed. So he says, I spend a lot of time trying to get people not to speed train, but to develop their body with different drills and exercises so they have the ability to speed. And he said, so many of them are putting like the cart before the horse. For sure. Do you see that? Yeah, so that, I mean, everybody comes to me because speed training is, you know, it's sexy in itself. I get it. I may address that need. It just might not be our first order of business. So the solution I have found that is more maintained is that if I improve your athletic ability, improve your brakes, improve your potential to create force, oh, look at that, you're six, seven miles out faster. But if I skip all that, just work speed, it only hang on so long before I introduce potential for injury or, you know, playing worse. I, I've seen that where I, I have people who have come to me after they failed with uh, their golf season because they just addressed speed in the off season. And then they came in with me, we addressed strength, posture, balance, then speed or and speed, and they played better. So that is a, a primary conversation I'm having with my player is when I look at their club head speed, is it a need that can be addressed now or is it a need that I need to address other things before we address it? So like if somebody's coming to me, uh, they've been working with me for quite some time and they've got a speed leak, they've got a power leak, we like to call it, and they're just moving inefficiently, either loading or posture in the, in the, in the swing, we can fix that right here, right now. But if they've got a posture and an imbalance and a balanced posture, and then I just address a speed need, I haven't really solved any of the problems. So I, yeah, a lot. Yeah. a lot. I find a lot of people can swing faster, but they don't because they can't support it. Yeah. And, I, and I'll just show them that. I'll take them and I'll have them do a swing. And, and I'll have them do a swing at about this speed and try to be able to stop here. And they and then keep going. At some point, they can't stop it because they don't have the braking system to do it. So I'm like, well, you can only swing this fast until you learn how to brake. So you've got the speed. You, we can increase speed four, five, six, ten miles an hour. But until you learn how to support it, you know, you'll see someone swing really fast, and they're gonna for the first time they fall over because their body hasn't learned how to absorb all the energy they just created. All right. So going back to Kevin's point about the braking system is if they can't brake, they're gonna like they're all, they're gonna they can, maybe they'll swing faster. But they're going to hit it further offline, and they're going to probably get hurt. Kevin, I'd like the two of you, if you would, to to talk because I hear breaking system a lot in, in, in golf structures. I think there's a lot of new terminology, right? It's like ground forces. We hear a lot about speed training. We hear a lot about. If you could talk to Kevin and what is your ideas from a, a instructor standpoint on the breaking system? And then Kevin Duffy, what are your ideas as far as the braking system from a fitness standpoint? I I think that it would go, it would depend. But primarily, if somebody can't get into their glute, we're going to see a, a back fire. So primarily, is that what you're asking? I'm asking, what is a braking system like? Right. Image, so like we uh, we've all heard that term about Tiger complaining he wasn't activating his glutes. At some point, right. and then that became world press information yep. for you know two or three weeks, and now everybody wants to activate their glutes. Okay, so 
what does activating a glute mean? Is do I need glute activation in order to have breaking? There's it's just a lot of nomenclature out there. Everybody throws around, and I think it's never fully defined so we can understand. Yeah, it. it's it's you know when I started coming up and teaching and learning from Jim McLean, it was just posting up the ability to, to get onto your left side, let it straighten up. Doesn't have to lock up. Let it straighten up, and then support yourself in a balanced finish position. You hear. And the faster you go, the more support you do. And it's become a breaking system because we're talking about the ability to strengthen the core, use your glutes, lose your legs. But it's it's can you put back one second, can you go to here and stop? So the breaking system there is if we break it down into biomechanical, I'm pushing down hard into the ground. So my left leg can straighten up, which helps my hips rotate and activates the rest of my body. Somebody who has Poor footwork or they, their knee size, like they can't stop as easy. And so, so the braking system is basically just another way of saying just posting up. You know, we talked about Tiger snapping his leg back, doing that. Well, that's that, that was, was one, his braking that system. was his braking system. Some people they they break so hard they actually jump. You look at the long drive guys. That's just a braking. They they push so hard on the ground because the braking was what accelerates the glove going through. If you think about um, if you're in a car. And you have a cup of water and you break slowly, the water won't spill, but you step on the brakes, the water goes up against the windshield, right? It just generates more speed. Well, that's what the braking system helps you do, but you need to be able to have the, the physicality to be able to do it so you so you can break and not get injured. Yeah, you start bottom up. So um, every day I tell people they need to pull something of you know worth off the floor because I'm going to learn to push down through the floor and pick something up. I'm going to use everything that I would need, same exact muscle groups as I am when I'm pushing and pulling into the floor when I swing. So hex bars, popular, dumbbells, kettlebells, but picking something off the ground using your lower frame to do so is the most impactful way to create breaks. But in conjunction with that, the more upper body thing is to have heavy load in your hands or high or low, um, more so than just your traditional plank or forward press, because essentially I have side bending in every swing. My obliques, if they are not working, my you know QL, my low back, my spine will pick up the slack. Whereas if I had done the, the, the training to create a stronger oblique and a stronger frame, more so than just planking, I, I will, have much more potential for force without the breakdown. One of the things I've observed over the years and, and having played with our hockey players, yeah. right? I've never met a hockey player. And those who the students I have now who played at the high school or collegiate hockey kill the golf ball, right? They have tremendous speed. Why is that? So it's uh, two, two answers to that. A lot of hockey players shoot lefty in hockey. And they golf right, which is your the opposite. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's the opposite. So they'll have a higher potential for force because they have trained both sides of the body. So they have this slack shot, but they also have a backhand, right? The same with tennis players. And then from a hockey perspective, they have to use their hips so much because they, you know, if they turn their skate out to the side, they have something to press on. But sometimes some of those quicker shots are just coming from hip and wrist. So their ability to create speed in a smaller, smaller movement window is there because they they're training it from a biomechanic standpoint. Hockey is a closer crossover than baseball. Um, so I would say there's like three parts to that. One, a lot of them are swinging and shooting on both sides. Two, they're more athletic. And three, their ability to create force in like a shorter window is, is they're already doing it on a regular basis. But their legs are really strong too. Yeah, and their legs are also body. absolutely yeah. massive. They haven't skipped a leg day ever. Because they skip out too, right? Yeah, you don't really have a choice, right? The the unicorn is the hockey player who off ice is unathletic. I'm like, really? that's that always confuses me. That's a unicorn. And and you mentioned earlier that you have a YouTube channel. I have a couple of, yeah, you, Instagram's my most uh, prominent way. It's code, at Coach Kevin Duffy. But I have a YouTube channel where I throw up uh, either the presentations or uh, my warm-ups. Uh, but the, the golf uh, on-range warm-up, I 
have a video on on my YouTube channel. And well. your website is coachkevinduffy.com. Yes, sir. Up there in Acton, Massachusetts. Yes. Do we have any questions from the audience? Well, one of the things just to reiterate, the, um, when Bryson came out in January, February of that year, you know, he was a monster. Mm -hmm. But what he had been doing is that he had said that he'd been training 18 months for him to get ready to unveil this. That, that unveil, of course, was actually only a two month period, yep. but he was prepping his body for the force uh, for, you know, almost a year and a half. Yeah, he created so much force that, uh, I mean, People were saying he was going to break down. He's going to break down. Uh, I didn't think it was going to happen. Um, it, it, it did, but way later than people were predicting. Uh, I mean, the talking heads only know so much. But uh, with the amount of training he was doing for speed, he was very well aware that if he did the speed training without adding straight up mass, that it would be extremely difficult. So in order to chase that speed, he did the speed chase with the body transformation, which is where it goes in. So like the most, like the stack system guys should, uh, they probably already did, but cut Fitzpatrick a giant check because he told them um, that stack was what he used to increase his club history. He didn't really mention that he also gained 15, 20 pounds. Matt Fitzpatrick put on a lot of weight while he added stack training. So the, the ability to create force is good, but the balance is he's Bryce is probably going to he's probably going to have a much better season as he lost a lot of weight, uh, but he's still up from prior. He just had a a lot of weight. He had to kind of find a little bit more of a middle ground. He I would expect him to have a better season upcoming. We will never see him play, but <laughs> but uh, I expect him to have a better season. Yeah, well, you'll see Bryson play if we go to any of the Trump facilities. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see some of the events. I think we'll have the TV contract. Right? All right. So when uh, so when we're unveiling this whole whole speed training idea, there's we pull that curtain back. There's a lot of physical training going on to be able to create that speed, to be able to use your braking system as as Kevin Sprecher mentioned. He, in order to give me more speed, I have to have a braking system to absorb that force mm -hmm. in order to avoid injury. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, speed without brakes is the easiest, e easiest comparison is Ferrari and doing a golf cart. So speed without brakes, bad, bad combo. It'll look cool ripping around Sleepy Hollow. This looks like a fun drive for that, but you're definitely crashing. And when I when I'm doing that without the braking system, then I'm probably prone to some type of injuries. Yeah, it's it uh, it would be a uh, negligent diagnosis to just train speed the other one without having the background of, of what the body's doing. It, 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 you, would be, you could have success, but you're playing on, a, on an edge that so you don't need to unnecessarily. If you're already taking the time out to do 15, 20 minutes of speed work and, you know, twice a week, add two days of strength, much better. You, what are you you're talking about multiple workouts each week? Two, yeah, predominantly. Um, you like a day off? Yeah, post uh, out of season, I prescribe primarily three days, um, about 30, 45 minute workouts every time they're in with me. Um, they do their warm up their own, they jump into the group and we, we go. Um, then in season, we flip to two. Uh, and then if they have a peaking period, like if they're, for example, like say their tournaments in August, they'll have a peaking period in which the two to three um, weeks prior, they up their training and then come back down a little bit. So we'll play, I don't guess. So like if if uh, they're preparing for like Mass, Mass Am is one of the biggest tournaments for the clients that I have. So if we're peaking for Mass Am, the two weeks before they are either chipping, putting or in the gym. That's pretty much their... So basically, this this whole we're, so we're not taking time off with our training. We're we're year round training, as you mentioned earlier, in order to maintain your yeah. Your I don't need you to. I don't need you to get stronger in the season. I need you to not get weaker. Right. So it's a, my active goal is to not decrease my numbers from when I was really strong. And then Kevin Sprecher, what have you like? So you and Kevin have developed this relationship, and you understand what he's trying to do with the body now. How has that affected your teaching with your students? Has that kind of 
gave you a little different, you know, road to go down? Yeah, I mean, I've been involved with it for a while, but I'm definitely more aware of how people move and ask them about their training. And if they're not getting involved in it, even just some basic band work and some exercise stuff, um, like the overspeed training, I've seen more people get hurt than actually gain speed because they're trying to swing really fast and the body just can't, can't take it. I so when you had approached me about doing the seminar, uh, you were very excited about what was going on with you and Kevin Duffy and how you're better understanding what you're doing with your students. And have you seen that uh, their ability to better strike the ball to their endurance during rounds? I think that a lot of people, because they're not kids, they wear out on the back nine. And I know my students are coming back to me and saying, it's my golf swing. And I said, I don't think so. I think it's your body. Yeah, no, I've definitely seen they're able to maintain over 18 holes or they're playing tournaments, 36 holes. Um, they feel better, they can practice more. So if they can practice more, they can get better faster. They pick up speed just because they're stronger and they're more efficient without even speed training. They're just, they're just picking up speed that way. And I would think that if I had the discipline to do my, my work in the gym, work with Kevin and, and his exercises, do what you want me to do, that's got to give me a, a mental confidence and my outlook I, I makes me much more positive because I'm more fit and more able. Sure. Yeah. Just like just like Kevin said, you know, those back nine holes, you're just as strong as you're on the front nine hole. So I know that I can hit a seven iron the same distance I did on the first hole, but I can on the 17th hole. And the guy that I'm playing with who's not in good shape has got to hit that hybrid. Is that still 185, 190? Just a little bit. <laughs> All right, so uh, do we have any other questions? Shannon, do you have any physical questions for the crew? I know you have some. I guess um, I work at a company about where most of my golfers are their weekend golf, right? And so they'll come in and say they, you know, they've been along the program. Um, I think the biggest struggle is getting that connection between golf and fitness. Um, in terms of just the, the average weekend golfer, it sounds like a lot of the stuff we're talking about today was really, I don't know, somewhat geared toward more, I don't say elite golfers, but probably a little bit better golfer. Um, what is your best advice, I guess, for your average weekend guy who works five days, yeah. how we can get a Monday or Friday up, hopefully through the weekend, you know, and how they can get that fitness and then work with their coach. Like, what is your advice to that guy that comes in? So that guy is actually who's going to make the largest change. So the smaller end change, like the smallest change I would be able to actually make would be my LPJ. Who's my best? She's my best player. The largest change would be a guy like you know, John I saw yesterday. Had, uh, or not yesterday, yeah, yesterday he would have the ability to make a larger change than that elite athlete. So putting that into his, like, let's say if on Tuesday night, he sneaks out to putt. I would argue that if he adds 30 more minutes of strength training before that putting session that he goes into, he may have a larger differential in his actual score over the season than if he just played golf all the time. So convincing people when it's important to add training is really important. And one of the tricks I've said to people when see people say, I don't have time. I said, just replace the word time with care. And that hits home and they don't like that. But if you say, if you don't care about getting better, that's fine, it's, it's okay. And then they'll say, all right. Uh, and then they'll find the time. So like, I mean, I have a four month old at home, so I'm starting to get it, but like, I have time and he's crying all the time. So you can figure it out. Like there is a way for you to add two kettlebells in your basement, go do some deadlifts. Right. Four sets of 10 takes you maybe seven minutes. So, and that was going to be my point is I think we need to explain to them. Everyone says workout. They think oh, I got to go to the gym and it's going to be hours. And it's half an hour ride to the gym. Hour, it's two hours. Well, I don't even have that much time. I kept on my basement. I, I can go downstairs because I'm teaching 10, 12 hours a day, but it, it could just be go downstairs for 15 minutes and go do a kettlebell exercise today and do a band exercise tomorrow and do this the next day. You, you know, I haven't met anybody who can't find 15 minutes. Yeah, how much time do you spend watching Netflix? 
But it's a program. But I'll send the guy to care. So okay, here's a guy. He works Monday through Friday. He plays golf Saturday, Sunday. Build him a program that, that he can do at home, five to ten minutes. That's going to address what he needs, so he can do a little bit every day. Like I, when I tell people when they learn their swing, I'd rather have them practice five to ten minutes a day than once a week for an hour. No, for sure. Yeah. Because they're you know, just doing it constantly, they're, they're going to learn it better. So if they if they did a five to ten minute workout every day, that five to ten minutes will turn into ten to fifteen minutes. They'll feel better and then they'll they'll develop it. But you have to you have to sell it that way. Yeah, I, I have found that selling it in a more digestible manner is easier than saying, "Hey, I need you in one hour, once a week." Or if I said, "Hey, how, you got four twenty minutes." And then if they say no, I'm like, hey, what have you been watching on Netflix? And they tell me, I'm like, how long is that show? Yeah, <laughs> see what I'm doing here? And they're like, oh, foot and mouth. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, you can do it. Hey, watch your show while they look up. Yeah, I mean, I do. I throw on Netflix on uh, downstairs and I just uh, keep my phone away with me because you can't email and work out. What do you like kettlebell movement wise? One of the questions too is like, what are some of your favorite kettlebell movements? Kettlebell swings, kettlebell cleans, kettlebell carries. Those are my top three. And swings. those are on your YouTube channel? They're on every YouTube channel. Kettlebell swings, kettlebell cleans, and kettlebell carries are everywhere. Those are, I think they're on my YouTube channel as well, but yeah, they're, it's a, the swing is a triple extension exercise where our hips come forward. So if you had somebody who is like a real, Aggressive early extender, don't send them there first. All right. Teach them to hinge. So deadlift more so. And what's the purpose of the weight when you're doing when you force kettlebell weight force? Yeah. So I'm gonna like uh if I gave Kev a 15 pound kettlebell, that's an inaccurate weight for a guy his size. So he wouldn't he wouldn't need to create as much force to move that kettlebell. But if I gave him a 40, 50 pound kettlebell and taught him the correct form. The force there is going to be much more uh, uh, important than if I gave him a higher rep scheme with a lower weight. So accurate weight load uh, for a person of certain size is going to be important. So like if you're 200 pounds, you shouldn't be using a 20 pound kettlebell. It's, it's like a paperweight. You, you throw it all over. There. And so if I got to 200 pounds, which I hope doesn't happen anytime soon, unless it's not. Yeah. What kind of weight would I use? 45. 45. 40. I mean, I'm 192 pounds. I use a 44 pound kettlebell. Right. 20 and kilograms. And if I were, say, a high school player, 150 pounds. 150. 30. 30. And if I were a 100 pound lady, oh, math numbers. <laughs> say it. Uh, if I were a hundred pounds lady, like you take, you know, like most women are somewhere in that. I would probably say she would be using 25, okay, so 25, 30, yeah. anything under, anything, if you're doing a kettlebell swing, anything under 20s. So we're talking about 20 to 25% of my total weight. Yeah, yeah that's the same investment. Okay. Yeah, and then you can progressively overload. And I'm going to overload to create you more. You progressively weight. get stronger. Get stronger, more yeah. strength, more strength, more force, more force, more ability to break. Correct. So it's very cyclical. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you got a four month old to be. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Any other questions from anybody? Just real, real quick, you talk about rotation and over the years, a lot of like throwing that in small. Yes. Yeah. Like, really yeah, med balls, med balls are a field room. You're not going to try to replicate a golf swing with a medal. The problem, and I've actually I had a conversation with a golf pro who had a really distaste for med balls. It's my job in the weight room to create fields. The biomechanics will get messed up if I'm using a 20-pound med ball and trying to create a golf swing. It's really inefficient. There's a reason that speed stick has a, a weight that's only 10% heavier than your, your driver, or 20%. You know, nothing more than that. So anything when you take a med ball and it's really heavy and it really tweaks the biomechanics to the point where my hands are for my hips because the things that would really get in the way. But if from a med ball in my gym, I have four, six, and eight. 
my fours are beat up, my sixes are beat up, my eight, eights look kind of branded. So I wouldn't have ordered the eights because I needed more ball. When we load into the hip, I'm creating a load pattern and a transition pattern. It's the golfers and the golf pros job to understand that I'm just teaching a better physical athlete. And if I tried to swing a golf club like this, I wouldn't hit the ball. So in order to have the concepts go together, the person delivering the message should say, hey, we're working on the physical needs to hit a golf ball, but this is not your golf swing. And I say that all the time. Oftentimes what I do is I found a trick where I just have my golfers, I'm like if you're ready to start lefty, and then they kind of, because if I, if I give a med ball prescription and I turn my back, that will turn into a golf looking med ball pro quickly. So I prescribe lefty first. It's just like one of my tricks. Um, or righty first, depending, and then remind them that it is not your swing. But in order to create, you know, the hip being first, they're to have some side bend and a lag behind and my hands last and pinch in your foot absolutely has correlation, but it isn't your swing. It is a training tool. So they have a purpose, but as soon as they get super heavy, totally mess up the biomechanics, then you could make the argument that it might be detrimental to that person. But correct med ball training. Good. Uh, like very high. fours, eights, sixes. Those are my those are my ways of choice. And also I would like the smaller balls, but sometimes those just bounce right back at you. So be careful. I use the softer one. So you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I have a rolling machine. Is there any benefit in yeah? Yeah, I would say the only Detriment could be like if you have like really tight hip flexors, you might overuse that. Um, but I would probably say for golfers, a row machine would be more beneficial than a peloton. Um, they start, I think they started to do some research on that. There was some pushback between peloton and even for glutes at all. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a flexion extension of the leg, right? So we got legs and then we got a pole. So of the cardio machines that you're going to do, if you're saying, hey, what's going to be most beneficial for golf? You could make that argument. I would say sprinting is closer replica to the demand of the swing, which we had a conversation about uh, the other day. But like for cardio for golf, if I was chasing a speed window, I have sprints in my program for all. So all my junior golfers are going to be coming up this next month into a speed program. They all will be sprinting. So sled pushing, sprinting, high intensity outputs. The most violent thing you do in sport, and well, in this sport is the swing, but it's also replicated by jumping, sprinting, and then in our case, swinging. So I'm expressing force differently than other sports. And you do that for fast twitch muscles? Yes. Yeah. So I would say if you were going to pick a piece of cardio machine, I'd say rowing is great. But if you're going to say what cardio is closest to the golf swing, it's sprinting. Now, when you say sprinting, am I running for a, a small period as fast as I can? You're the last car there. Yeah. 40 yards. Do I, train, do I train over weeks to do that, or you want that right now? Uh, we're training for quite some time. I'm having you sign a waiver. And then, <laughs> <laughs> then I can teach you to sprint. So. All right, so I can go to Massachusetts and learn how to sprint. Yeah, you sure. Any other questions? Kevin, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very um, much. I understand why, why Kevin called me and wanted you to come in because you're very knowledgeable. I like the fact that you know the golf swing and that you're a golfer. Um, I like the fact that you got a four month old, so I know you're not sleeping, so you're spending a lot of time thinking mm -hmm. about this. Kevin's preferable always. Yep, it's a pleasure you. to be at City Hollow. So, Kevin Duffy is Coach Kevin. Yeah, Coach Kevin Duffy on all social media. And that's D U F F Y. And we might do a road trip to Massachusetts and go up some chowder and, and learn how to get fit. Uh, so you'd be open to doing seminars if we keep yeah, a group I, of professionals I, together? I've been traveling uh, and I'm setting up my travel schedule for the spring as well. Okay. So coachkevinduffy.com, Kevin Sprecher here at CP Hollow. Thank everybody for tuning in this morning. And I think the, the what I got out of this today was my fitness 
needs to support what I want to do with somebody's golf swing for sure. Right. Absolutely. And so if I'm going to get faster and stronger, then I'm going to have more ability to hit the ball further. Yep. Same goal. All right. So thank you for tuning in. See you Thursday morning with uh, Mark Brody from Columbia. And then on Friday, we have Club Repair with Paul Curran. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy the change in weather.